I know there's a lot of frustration out there, and I don't want people to, there's almost anger that we can't get parts. You know, the folks on this, Michael, Steve, myself, our companies don't succeed unless our customers succeed. So we're truly trying to help in this. But you look at there's been some force majeure that's been causing constraints on resins, metals, precious metals, commodity metals. All these are building blocks for the components that we source. We've had fires that, that have affected certain factories. We've had countries impacted by COVID that have had forced factory government shutdowns. This is the you know the perfect storm, if you will, that, that we're seeing that initiated with semiconductors, but certainly we're seeing constraints across the portfolios. From EE Tech Media, this is Moore's Lobby, where engineers gather to talk all about circuits. I'm Daniel Bogdanoff. Have you ever imagined what it would be like to go through the chip shortage, but from the distributor's perspective? For Industry Tech Days 2021, we brought in three people who don't have to imagine it because they are living in the throes of it right now. Today we get to sit in on that live session. Let's jump right to it. You've been living under a rock, you maybe haven't heard of the chip shortage. But if you've tried to do almost anything other than live under a rock, especially anything electronics related, you certainly know about the chip shortage. Every industry from automotive to industrial automation is feeling the effects of it. And if you're like me, you've been screaming into the void about long shipping times and wondering when it's going to end and just, just why. Let's redirect those questions from the void to three titans of the silicon industry who are here live to share their perspective on supply chains, component lead times, and the lessons we should and must learn from this whole experience. Please welcome Dave Doherty, the president and CEO of distributor DigiKey Electronics, Steve Sangi, the executive chair of semiconductor manufacturer Microchip Technology, and Michael Knight, the corporate senior vice president of business development of distributor TTI. Well, thank you all for being here. I am really, really excited for this session. Can you each tell me a little bit about your backgrounds, what you do at the companies you're in, and your place as a company in the semiconductor supply chain? Steve, let's start with you. Certainly. Microchip is a semiconductor manufacturer that is very uh, has a very broad product line consisting of microcontrollers, microprocessors, FPGAs, and then all the other chips that go around it to complete the customer solution, like analog, mix signal, power management, all of the connectivity protocols like USB, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and, and discrete products, everything really needed to complete a solution around the microcontroller or processors. Microchip sales run rate is about $6.5 billion a year and a market capitalization of about $42 billion. All right, uh, Dave, how about you? Sure, sure. I should complete Steve. He's being humble, though. Steve's been uh, leading that ship for a long time and, and now is chairman. And growing up to the operational side, I've had the pleasure of, of knowing him over a couple of decades. Now, for DigiKey, we're a distributor, so we don't manufacture anything. We partner with manufacturers like Microchip to provide a, a host of solutions to customers. A little over 2 million parts in stock, our claim to fame is, is really that availability and, and high service, if you will. You won't find a lot of DigiKey people out on the street, but uh, many folks are familiar with prior, previously the catalog and, and now the website, representing over 1,500 or so manufacturers. And again, most people knew us early on as, as the engineering playhouse. You know, I used to describe us as Toys R Us for electronic components, but since they filed Chapter 11, I try to refrain from that uh, example a little bit more recently. <laughs> But um, and then, you know, going from the engineering desk to that short run production companies like you know, Keysight Technology, where they may not make a gazillion like you would an iPhone, but you're looking for that availability and service. <laughs> All right. And then what is what is your role at, at DigiKey? Yeah, I've been I've been present here for the last seven years. I've been with the company for 13 and I've had the. You know, the advantage, I've been in this industry since the mid-80s graduating from school. It certainly made me older. I don't know about wiser, but I have had the vantage point of working as an engineer, as a consumer of electronic components and a, a supply chain recipient to being on the manufacturer side to this last half of my career on the distribution side. And Michael, how about you? Uh, so Michael Knight, um, I run the semiconductor uh, 
portfolio at TTI, which is better known for interconnect passive electromechanical. But uh, a few years ago, we started down this path of taking our model, our distribution model uh, to the semiconductor world. Once upon a time, this model was uh, very pervasive. Uh, companies like Unique, and Mimic, uh, Mimic and uh, Insight and others, um, specialty semiconductor distributors. And uh, over the years, as the industries consolidated, especially led by some of the bigger public uh, distributors, those options had been removed for both customers and suppliers. So we thought um, there would be a, a market for uh, kind of a, 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 you know, a blast from the past. And so we've put together what's called actually uh, the Exponential Technology Group in recognition of the exponential nature of, tech, nature of technology, especially driven by uh, leading edge semiconductors and leading edge semiconductor suppliers. Um, so I've been responsible for building that out the last few years. And it's uh, not only a classic distribution business, but there's some stuff as a service business uh, in it. Um, we've got uh, design services, a lot of stuff that's uh, very focused on uh, helping customers design in uh, the latest and greatest stuff. And then the idea, of course, is to pull the ip and &E stuff in behind the semiconductor stuff we're working on. So the company in total is uh, will be well north of $6 billion this year. And it's uh, in 2004, I think, we were acquired by Berkshire Hathaway. So we're actually a Berkshire Hathaway company for those who uh, haven't heard of us. Do you have Warren Buffett on speed dial? Yeah. It's, uh, no, actually, the better question is if Warren has me on speed dial. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair point. I'm sure he <laughs> I hope does. for your sake that he does not. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, with this group of people, we have to talk about the chip shortage. And that's been a very real part of everyone's, anyone in engineering, like that's just top of mind as you build out a bomb, as you go through and design for a part, and then you have to you know, change it out on the fly. Um, Mike, we'll start with you on the, on the chip shortage. Is it limited to certain markets like automotive or is it more of a broad based issue? And are there any sectors that are especially hit? So the, the headlines all around automotive. Um, but uh, to your question, it is much more broad based, but the, the automotive thing definitely overshadows and has a big bearing on availability for other market segments. I mean, that, uh, it's looking at, so to, just to, as a data point, the automotive in the U.S. light passenger vehicle production in 2017 peaked at uh, almost 18 million cars. Um, this year, it's going to be closer to 14 million. Um, and of that 14 million, uh, as many as 4 million may not actually be able to ship or be sold to an end customer because it's uh, missing parts. And it's uh, right now, typically, the gating item is going to be something semiconductor related, um, especially in microcontrollers. You know, the average car these days has something like 1,400 semiconductors in it. Uh, so lots of opportunities to, uh, to have a problem. You know, if you're missing just one of those 1,400, you may not be able to ship the vehicle. So th this is getting uh, a lot of attention and it, it seems you can't get away from it. This week alone, both uh, Volvo and Gothenburg announced that they were going to have to shut down production because of chip shortages and uh, Nissan in Tennessee. But this is a this is a much bigger thing. Um, it's in mobile phones. It, any anything that uses semiconductors is potentially being impacted, um, and that's I, honestly uh, I think that's only going to get worse before uh, it gets better. Yeah, I remember hearing an interview with the designer who developed the Tesla door handle that pops out, and that alone had its own microchip and bootloader and all that. So the the breadth of it was, I think, not lost on on folks. Dave, have you seen this in other components like passives or connectors? Um, are there you know is this across industry or is this more kind of on the on the semiconductor side? No, clearly. And, you know, I, I pinged Steve earlier because he gave me some insight about six, nine months ago that I thought was very insightful and asked if he'd share it. But, you know, I, I'd say to Michael's comment about automotive taking the headlines for the end customer application, semiconductors have taken the headline, but it's not the full story. The carryover effect has been huge to other areas like 
capacitors and magnetics, timing devices, resistors. And the reasons for this are there's a multiple reasons. You know, first of all, some of these parts use semiconductors. So you have the whole issue of building blocks. If you if you can't get the semiconductor timing device, it's tough to produce a temperature controlled crystal oscillator. And the materials, you know, and, and I'll pause real quickly because I know there's a lot of frustration out there and I don't want people to there's almost anger that we can't get parts. You know, the folks on this, Michael, Steve, myself, our companies don't succeed unless our customers succeed. So we're truly trying to help in this. But you look at there's been some force majeure that's been causing constraints on resins, whether it's nylon or liquid crystal polymers, metals, precious metals, commodity metals. All these are building blocks for the components that we source. And then, you know, to add insult to injury with Murphy's Law, we've had droughts in Taiwan. And you think, well, what's a drought got to do with it? Well, water is a huge component in manufacturing these, these parts, and a lot of them come from Taiwan. We've had fires that, that have affected certain factories. We've had countries impacted by COVID that have had forced factory government shutdowns. And so this is a... You know, this is the you know the perfect storm, if you will, that that we're seeing that initiated with semiconductors, but certainly we're seeing constraints across the portfolios. Today's keynote is brought to you by Winbond, a leading global supplier of semiconductor memory solutions headquartered in Taiwan. Their customer-driven memory solutions include specialty DRAM, mobile DRAM, code storage flash, and trust me, secure flash. For more information, visit www.winbond.com. And now we're back with Steve Sangi of Microchip, Michael Knight of TTI, and Dave Doherty of Digikey. Steve, can you comment on like the availability of materials like masks and photoresist and how that impacts the ability to get semiconductors out the door? So let me size the problem first, you know, with some data points about the shortage. So, you know, in our quarter ended uh, June 30 of this year, our uh, net sales were $1.57 billion. On the top of that, we were delinquent to customers' request for about 50% more of that number. So if, if the availability of products was to be unlimited, we could have shipped 50% more than what we did. You know, that's, that's kind of one size of the problem. Now, if you look at the total backlog, if you consider the backlog pre-pandemic, uh, to be normal, let's say prior to the pandemic, if whatever the backlog was, if you were to call it normal, today the backlog is 4x that normal. And that raises all sorts of questions from investors and others, you know, whether it's all real, whether there is any double ordering. The backlog is scheduled out. It's not all in one quarter, but it's 4x normal. Uh, it's just absolutely enormous. enormous. The third data point would be lead times. You know, pre-pandemic, our lead times on most products were four to eight weeks. Today, you know, every critical product in the company has a lead time of 52 weeks plus. You know, there are, you know, parts that are available in six months or less here and there. So largely, if the customer hadn't planned that far ahead, then we're largely busy helping customers you know, uh, get around and really substitute the products, re-engineer it, use an alternate product with more memory, less memory, more features, less features, uh, figure out some way to really use some other product that happens to be available. So, you know, getting to shortages of materials and all that, you know, we are, uh, we're not getting shortages in photoresist or wafers or you know, those things we had planned well. We had plenty of supply of photoresist. We have our own mask shop, so we were able to make the masks. Uh, where we saw shortages was in uh, lead frames, which uh, essentially come out of metal, and uh, lead frames are heavily short. Substrates, you know, for advanced products, it's a multi-layer substrate on which you flip the chip and bond it. Uh, those are, you know, six months, eight months, nine months lead time, sometime a year. And then also, as uh, Dave described, all the metals and chemicals, and there are kind of shortages everywhere. So if you hadn't planned well ahead of time how much you're going to need in this upturn, then you're dealing with shortages and lead times. So 
And direct labor, by the way, direct labor, I wanted to mention, um, in all of our factories in U.S., we cannot find a direct labor to, to ramp the capacity. Uh, we are limited in output by mm. direct labor, not equipment, because government essentially gives you the money for not working more than if you were working in the factories. So at least for a direct labor perspective, you know, waiting for all these unemployment benefits to go away in September is critically important so that people can come back to work for the factories and ramp the production. And to kind of reverse the order here, what sort of timeline are we looking at to get back to a more normal state? Or is this just the state of, of engineering for a while? And Steve, we'll start with you and work backwards. So I think, uh, you know, you hear various inputs on the timeline, but I think it's reasonably clear that, you know, these will persist at least for a, another year. So middle of next year, uh, maybe things start to open up. You know, people will always tell you, some people will tell you that semiconductor cycles have been repealed and this is new normal and these shortages will be there forever and prices will only go up. and you know, there'll never be enough capacity. And, you know, those pundits have been wrong for 40 years. You know, cycles come, this will end. Uh, <laughs> you know, there will be, you know, there'll be overcapacity and, you know, cycle will go down and, you know, all the things will go the other way. But I think, uh, I think it's minimum we are here for a year and uh, possibly the rest of 2022. Dave, what are your thoughts? Yeah, Daniel, I don't know. There's much more I can add. I, you know, I think Steve is at the front end of this, and he probably has the best vantage point. I can tell you that to Michael's earlier point, we're not seeing any signals that this is is reversing anytime soon. You know, capacity gets added in big chunks, in particular on semiconductors, because you get big items like fabs that um, provide a step up. It's hard to linearly increase capacity. And Steve's mentioned some of the unusual constraints like labor that don't typically exist. So there's so many external factors that could weigh into this. I will say that I do have confidence, Steve and his counterparts, this industry has proven remarkably resilient. And we have been through these cycles and we will get through this again. But I don't want that to sound like any level of complacency in our customers part. They play a critical role by giving us accurate forecast because a lot of this in every cycle typically starts with unforecasted demand. You know, Michael talked about the automotive statistics. Look where we were last March and April of 2020. We Companies weren't shipping anything. And so to go from a complete stop to a, a full ramp up just isn't practical for, for anybody. Yeah, Michael, how do you, did you see this sort of thing coming and how do you handle it in the, you know, in the trenches here? Uh, we did to an extent because it's, it's logical uh, when you have a pullback like we had during COVID that there's going to be a snapback uh, afterwards. Um, it, it, so we were actually preparing for this middle of uh, last year. Um, what caught us by surprise is just how robust the snapback was. So there's a there's a lot of moving parts to this, both to the question about when do we come out of this? When when do things start to normalize and lead time start to retreat? Um, which is, you know, it, as uh, Steve and Dave have talked about, um, there's a lot of components there. But the simple answer, I, I think, actually is what's the longest lead time item? And, and for semiconductors, it's a fab. And uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about this, but I've seen uh, thing people talk about uh, two to two and a half years from the ground up for a new fab these days, because it's not just what it was typically, it's what it is today, given labor scarcity, uh, raw material scarcity. So there, there's a lot of stuff that has to be planned for that's kind of outside the norm. The other thing about that, that I think is really interesting is, you know, where we're, we're talking about adding new fab capacity actually happens to be places where there's not a lot of water, which is kind of a mystery to me, given what we're learning about the situation, you know, TSMC situation in Taiwan. So the other, the other thing related to all of this is uh, climate has, is having a big Im impact long before COVID climate was uh, uh, kicking the snot out of the supply chain because the supply chain has clumped up 
in places where there are people and people, uh, oddly enough, have clumped up in places where the climate has gotten very erratic. So I, I saw some stats. The last ones I, I saw for 2019 were that climate change alone had caused about one hundred and fifty billion dollars in revenue loss in the supply chain. Um, and it's I think when we see the 2020 numbers, it's going to eclipse that. So you have, you know, yeah. You have the pandemic effect, which we haven't really talked about. Um, it, you know, that's a wild card. The pandemic's got Malaysia shut down. So anybody that's doing back end or uh, has uh, is, has a fab in Malaysia, um, which is a lot of power semiconductors are coming out of Malaysia. That stuff uh, was already problematic and it's gotten more difficult. Um, you've got the ongoing trade dispute uh, with China and the ramifications of that, which are now spilling over into Taiwan. I personally, I'm very nervous about uh, what's going on between China and the U.S. with respect uh, to Taiwan. Um, you've got the fact that the uh, semiconductor equipment guys who, I mean, their backlogs are at record highs. Well, you know what they need to build their equipment is semiconductors. You, know, you, you talk about a catch-22, right? Um, and then you, you've got all of the inputs, you know, the raw material stuff, you know, copper is up like uh, 80%. Packaging is up since uh, COVID times, 50%, the packaging. So in, in IP&E, uh, even before COVID, the packaging oft, often cost more than the parts that were in the packaging, especially when it comes to things like a, a real of resistors. So that's just been exacerbated. So this is an awful lot of stuff to sort through and has to get back in sync before we can get back to uh, something that's normal. And I would throw on top of all of that, there's the economics of the situation from a, comp a component supplier standpoint. So for call it the last 50 years, the expectation from the customer base has been they're going to get more for less. And it's been a, a constant margin squeeze. Uh, especially on the channel, quite frankly, but for everybody in the supply chain. And this is uh, obviously uh, costs have gone way up and there needs to be a, a rebalancing and I think a realignment of incentives for the supply chain in order for us to dig out of this, in order for us to reconfigure the supply chain where there's not as much inherent risk related to climate and everything else. So one of the things that I think is uh, really interesting, uh, and I, I think Steve's probably in, in a, a really um, uh, good spot to uh, to look at this and watch this, but I, yeah, I think the supply chain leaders, the folks who have a lot of leverage in the supply chain, there's an opportunity here, and this is not going to be a very popular thing uh, for some people to hear, um, but I'm going to say it anyway. There's there's a little bit of a tough love thing going on with the customer base now, because uh, the, the customer base has been single mindedly focused on uh, uh, quarter on quarter cost reduction, understandably so. And uh, by the way, we're all beneficiaries of that, right? Because the TVs and things that we like to buy have gotten less expensive. Um, but uh, it, it that has a lot to do with the situation we're in uh, right now. Day sales and inventory for the supply chain historically have run about 40 days. And that's just not enough of a safety net when something goes wrong. It, but yet we never we had shortages in 2018. And did anything change in the supply chain? From my point of view, it didn't. I, I think the silver lining on this has got to be that this is enough of a shock that we start to modernize and evolve the way our supply chains work because most of these things were, mm -hmm. were designed and built 50 years ago and they are just not adequate for the for this environment. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dave, you, it seems like you might be stuck in kind of a pickle with you have engineers calling you saying, hey, I need my parts. And you have suppliers on the other end saying, you know, we're doing what we can. Can you talk about how how your your life is like kind of stuck in the middle of being an aggregate voice of the customer and an aggregate voice of a supplier. 
Yeah, it's a, no, it's a, it's a great question. You know, life used to be, in hindsight, pretty simple for us. We were shipping product off the shelf. 98% of the shipments came from inventory. There wasn't much backlog to have to manage. We'd be inventory rich, and, and we thought that was a challenge. But, boy, what, have, you know, what we've seen, you know, our in-stocks are at historic lows, and, and that challenge of trying to get it in. I think what manufacturers value is – um, our partners are typically pretty close to their large OEMs. They know the needs of the Fords or Boeings or Apple. And we try to be a voice of the masses and, and try to you know, provide some context around those voices. And it, it's helpful. You know, a year ago it was, hey, we've got some customers trying to build ventilators and we need some of these products. You know, the point was raised earlier. Hey, we have some customers. They may not be a household name to you, but they're making the equipment that's building the fab for you to produce more chips. So we've we've got a source and we've got to help these folks out. So to many of our customers, they don't have a direct communication link into the manufacturer. It's, it's through us. And, and we do our best to do both, you know, support this FIFO, take care of the folks that get their orders and their backlog in on us. But there are exceptional stories all the time that we try to communicate. It's, uh, it, it helps us all through, through this time. Communication is absolutely critical. Steve, if you could go back in time two years ago and, and tell yourself something, what would you what would you be saying to yourself in like 20, 2018, 2019? You know, I always love to go back in time, uh, but I haven't found <laughs> who can sell me that time machine. I got the check ready. Uh, you know, the, the the hindsight is always twenty twenty. You know, the two major events that happened, uh, the U.S.-China trade war in 2019, you know, followed by the COVID of 2020, which is still continuing, those two events were not predictable, uh, you know, absolutely not predictable. So when COVID hit in uh, March of 2020, my investors, uh, my board and analysts were all asking, you know, and Steve, what happens if you're Revenue goes down 35, 40%. What would happen? And we were carrying a you know, pretty large debt load, which we had uh, amassed when we bought Micro Semi um, in 2018 with $10 billion in cash. And we had a fair amount of debt and high debt leverage. And they were asking me to do the analysis if the business were to go down 40%, do you miss the covenants? How will you pay the debt? And you know, what would happen? Um, so, you know, what was microchip to do? We took steps, which we will do to prepare for the down cycle. We drew down our inventories. We put our factories on attrition. We reduced our capital expenditure. We didn't replace people when they left, um, and really did everything needed to conserve cash and kept paying debt. So, you know, if the worst happens at one time, we described that as a possible category six storm, there's no such thing, you know, category five is the highest, but if there's a category six storm, we still come out on the other end of it alive and can recover from there. So that's really, you know, we cut the salaries of our people worldwide. We zeroed out the bonuses, uh, you know, executive team starting from me, we were on a 20% salary cut. So we did everything to save cash. And then that storm never came. Our business really never went down. From a baseline of March 2020, our business was only down 1.3% in June. That's nothing. And then September was slightly up and then it started growing from there and we ran into the shortages. So if I could go back in the time machine and say that the worst we're gonna have is a 1.3% impact in our revenue, then I would, have, would not have done any of those things. I would have continued to invest and replace the people, run a factories full, and actually prepare for the upturn that was to follow and not have these kind of lead time. So if you ever can sell me a time machine, I'll pay a lot of dollars for it. <laughs> I'll start working on it, yeah. <laughs> um, Dave, were there any indicators that this was coming? Did you see in the market or in you know, reporting, you know, economic reporting that this type of thing was going to be upon us or, or was it a bit of a, you know, uh, blindsided, I know blindsided a lot of people to no fault of their own. Can you talk through through that? 
Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very similar story than what you heard from, from Michael and, and Stephen. You know, actually, we started seeing steady growth occur in June of 2020. We, we hit kind of a quick spike, a quick panic button that Steve described. And then we started feeling pretty good that the bottom wasn't going to be catastrophic. We also have the luxury of being totally private with a single owner. And so we went to him and said, hey, we're seeing these signals. And so we started building our backlog and building, frankly, building inventory of A and B items. So for a you know, private company, it's not getting that pressure on inventory. If you have some extra A, so what? The co- with the cost of money nowadays, it's just a matter of time to burn it down. So we thought we were actually in a pretty good position January with our inventory having grown nicely. But again, as been described, you know, keep in mind, we, we ping each other and the forecast at the end of last year consistent across the industry was low to single to low to mid single digits. So we kind of pegged that at 5% and we said the market we're in is a little typically a little stronger. We'll plan for 10% growth. Different factors, but just as Steve described, we didn't ramp up because we just saw none of these factors hitting to the magnitude in which they did. That makes sense. Michael, have you changed processes on your side at all and, and any thoughts on you know, maybe what we could have learned from 2018 and what we are hopefully learning now in 2020 and 2021? Yeah, uh, we, we haven't in that our model actually is, uh, has always been built for this. Um, and I, I, I think DigiKey, I can safely say DigiKey's model is the same. So uh, we actually do pretty well through these these uh, rough patches in the cycle. Um, so, you know, all, all of that said, I, I think there is a lot of stuff to be learned here that's got to be incorporated going forward because um, it, it, one of the things that, that's really obvious to me is that uh, COVID uh, has been an accelerator. And the important word there is accelerator of a lot of things. It's an accelerator of, of uh, you know, industry 4.0. It's an accelerator of the digitization of uh, human interaction. Um, it's an accelerator of a lot of things. And why accelerator is so important, what that implies is this was happening before COVID. So uh, I have actually for quite some time uh, been a strong believer that coming into the 2020s, that uh, things were really going to start to ramp in technology because electronics in particular is becoming so pervasive in everything. So we do a lot, for instance, in wireless and IoT, and everything's getting connected to the internet. There's tons of data uh, now that's being generated. Every I saw a stat that in the last two years, we've generated more data than all of the rest of human history. Uh, combined. Um, so all of this suggests that the demand for electronic components, which are the foundation of all of this, is only going to, it's going to grow exponentially. So if you accept that as a premise, then you do have to make some really interesting decisions in a really tough time. Um, it, you're going to have to, you're going to have to bet on the future because uh, it, it, from from our point of view, I, I view a distributor as uh, insurance for the supply chain. So inventory is, is an insurance for the supply chain, right? So th- think about it. Think about it this way: um, we all have cars and we all drive. In the course of our lifetime, we're going to spend one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars a year uh, for insurance, and um, none, none of us like doing it. And most of us, we're never going to have to use it. Uh, most of us, uh, thank God, are never going to have an accident. Um, but our industry has actually been motoring along with very little insurance for a long time. So this is the single biggest thing I think the supply chain has to uh, deal with going forward. We've, we've got to figure out how to ensure the continuity and the resilience of the supply chain, because the things that are shocking it, they're not momentary. As as Steve pointed out, there's some black swans for sure, but there's a lot of other stuff that is now happening regularly enough. You know, the the, the deep freeze in Texas uh, that we've got to, we've got to kind of pull our head out of the sand and, and look at the reality of this and start making some different uh, decisions. So to directly answer your question, uh, that's what we're, we're doing right now. And, and, and honestly, um, this complicated and we, we don't have 
uh, all the answers. But I do think we have a pretty good set of questions now. And that, that I believe, is a, a good starting point. So, so that was an interesting thought. The whole, it's almost like distributors act as a bit of a filtering capacitor, you know, smoothing out some of the, the fluctuations. Dave, do you agree with that? Or, or what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Totally agree. And I, you know, I, I think that's, um, that's, it's, it's a non-contested fact that this role is critical. And, you know, when you start thinking about the complexity of supply chain, companies are always going to be motivated to try to run as lean as they practically can. And as Michael described, we've probably gone beyond practical. And so, you know, I think customers rightfully so have multiple relationships depending on the situation. And so distributors, especially ones like TTI and DigiKey, we hold inventory, which has become a little bit of a misnomer for many industries and distribution. It's about how do you get it in on Tuesday, ship it out on Wednesday, and we recognize that that's a value proposition, uh, that that customers are willing to to, pay for that insurance. And that's just one small piece of what what Michael was describing. Just to maybe come back to it a bit, you know, our purchasing customers, maybe you're too good at what you do because, you know, it was it was part of an issue a couple of years ago with MLCCs, and I think we're seeing it now with resistors. Resistors are so darn cheap. If you're a manufacturer, what are you going to produce? You're going to produce products that you can produce profitably because that's, you know, those are the laws of business. And so, you know, I, I think maybe purchasing people have had the mindset, you know, that my supply chain will tell me when I'm pushing too hard and, and perhaps we haven't given those right signals, which has thrown some of these situations out of balance. Is this a just-in-time manufacturing program or like problem, or is it a, a bigger issue? Is it a mindset? You know, for me, you know, just-in-time is is a you know a neat buzzword. It's been around for a while. We're always going to have supply chain, right? Customers are going to need products. They're not going to want to hold uh, a year's worth of inventory. And so, whether, whatever you define as just-in-time is going to take even improved communications. Because let's face it, the customer's ability to forecast their end demand isn't going to get any better. With, uh, you know, we've got manufacturing techniques now that can turn on a dime. And so what we see customers is wanting to sample the market, micro manufacturing methodologies to, to test it and whichever hits, they want to turn too quickly. And so now we're going to have to be thinking differently. How are we going to give ourselves more flexibility in the design stage? Can we leave ourselves open to accept a potentially wider array of types of products? Are we aware that the complexities of, of tolerances or voltage range or temperature range and how do we build that in? When I came into the industry, I was a component engineer, and that's kind of what we looked at. That role has evaporated, which is fine if we can use good tools to get some of that flexibility back so that if we'll, and we'll never have the perfect balance of supply chain information, but if you can be nimble. And we're seeing customers now getting to the point that they're actually redesigning modules in their systems. I think it's a host of things, and I would echo what what Michael said. It's going to take some conscious discussions and for us to face these new realities, and when we do that, we'll be just fine. But we, we've got to get our head out of the sand. I'll, I'll steal Michael's line. <laughs> sure. Michael, um, video and wireless products are a big part of TTI's distribution. When COVID hit and everybody started working from home instantly, I remember trying to find a couple webcams for my team, and it was just like, where, and no one has them in stock. What's going on? So did that impact your 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 business and oppor- and what opportunities did that provide for you yeah it has and it, i think it's probably given lift to all of our businesses this whole uh the, the trend towards uh, uh let's just call it wireless communication um, and again that was something that was building momentum uh, pre-covid and covid's been an accelerator so uh for sure and it's in it's in everything you know, you've got uh Connected toothbrushes, which you could argue, does your toothbrush, do you really need to be getting data off your toothbrush? <laughs> um, you know, it, you know, on and on and on. And th- this, too, is going forward a, a, a massive driver for all of us. Um, that's, uh, I, I think, pretty, pretty exciting, you know, this, this concept of a connected world. Um, so, and, and, and we're seeing it, it, it's not just land-based terrestrial stuff. We've got a lot of content in these low earth orbit satellites uh, and these companies who are on a mission to connect all seven and a half billion of us to the internet, which is, you know, pretty mind blowing when you think about the, the size of the resulting human network and the potential of that. Um, I, I, that's very inspiring and I think going to be a big economic driver uh, of the future. So 
Um, yeah, it, it, the wireless stuff is awesome for us. And I would say the interesting thing about it at this point, and, I, and I'm, I'm sure Dave and S Steve can talk to this in a lot more detail than me, but what I'm finding is that the OEMs, you know, the people who are on this journey, this IoT journey, oftentimes don't have the skill sets uh, resident in-house to sort through all the different wireless protocols and, you know, make a decision between uh, long range Bluetooth or, you know, new 5G for industrial uh, applications. Um, so there's there's a, a knowledge gap between the app, people doing the applications and the technology that's available today, which creates a lot of uh, interesting opportunities to add value for all of us. And, and that's a that's will be a big focus in my company for the next couple of years, figuring out how to to jump in and help uh, close that gap and in essence, add a lot more value to our supplier relationships as well as our end customer relationships. And I think in another world, this panel discussion would be more about like 5G and Industry 4.0. Um, so I'd like to look for some silver lining in this you know, COVID chip shortage cloud. What sort of opportunities do you see for your companies going forwards um, in the next 18 months and in, even in the next like five years? And Steve, we'll start with you. So I think, you know, as I earlier said, you know, microchip is a very broad line supplier of uh, microcontrollers, processors, FPGAs, and all the connectivity protocols, discrete chips and power management and other things that go around it. And we also sell to multiple markets. You know, we sell it to industrial and medical, automotive, consumer appliances, aerospace and defense, communication, PC, data center. So, you know, being a broadliner and selling to multiple markets was really very helpful during the whole COVID crisis. For example, at the height of the COVID crisis in June last year, when our industrial and automotive business came down substantially, our medical and, and uh, data center business and PC business took off. You know, example, you know, 18 months ago, I, I never heard of a ventilator. I didn't know what a ventilator was. And then I discovered that we were designed into ventilators around the world. And a typical hospital will only have two ventilators because they hardly ever need it. And then every hospital wanted 3,000 ventilators. We got so much demand for chips into ventilators, it completely swamped us. And then, you know, digital thermometers, temporal scanners, you know, uh, oxygen pumps, all that stuff that is required in, in a medical screening and dealing with COVID and all the issues just absolutely took off. That business was probably, you know, up 50x or something. Same thing with, uh, with working from home. As people started working from home, many employees that only had a desktop at work needed to be fitted with a portable PC at home, along with upgrading uh, broadband routers, having a camera, being able to print at home. So all that part stuff took off company after company put their data on the cloud, you know, so it doesn't have to be maintained really in their own servers, which will require people to go to work. So the cloud business took off and that's the data center chips we ship into that were really, you know, ramping like crazy. And then all the people working from home in their spare time for entertainment, the gaming part took off. And as the people had more money because they were not driving and they were not buying clothes to go to work and all that, people were not taking vacations, people had a lot of savings and extra spending. And people invested all that into buying, buying toys that had electronics in it. You know, whether, whether they are toys, you know, uh, gaming toys or whatever. And so all that combined really being a broadliner as well as serving to multiple market was so helpful that we actually had a record year ending March 2021. You know, in, in the middle of a global pandemic that we haven't seen for 100 years, with the worst being down 1.3% in the June quarter 
and the ramp that followed ended our fiscal year ending March 2021 to be a record. So I think uh, definitely we see further growth in that same thing being broadliner and being in multiple markets. And now opportunities are coming like crazy in electrical vehicles, self-driving, you know, you know, more features into everything. So I think that's what's been helpful. Definitely some silver lining for for you there. Absolutely. Uh, Dave, we'll get to you in a in a second because I know we have some exciting news on, on your end. Um, but Michael, how about you? How did you what do you see going forward 18 months and even five years? Yeah, so it, it starts with a uh, fundamental assumption that um, I, I, don't, I don't think anybody actually in our industry could argue with, which is um, we're never going to use less processing power, less memory, less components uh, than we are using today. It's only going to go up. And so w- with that in mind, I mean, this is a, it's a remarkable place to be. How they're going to get sold, who the winners are, who the leaders are, uh, remains to be seen. You know, it, uh, there's, there's obviously our industry is well known for kind of continuous disruption. You know, it's uh, and I, I am actually a believer in this concept of um, you know, disrupt yourself before somebody else does it. Uh, but one of the things I, I love about that is it creates uh, opportunity. Whatever, wherever you, your place is in terms of share or um, you know, how you rank, um, t- tomorrow is a whole new game when you have this kind of growth. And then so the second, second uh, kind of truism that comes with that is this you know, rising tide uh, lifts all boats thing. So uh, I, I am crazy bullish uh, on the future. And we've had a really phenomenal past that I think the uh, future, and I'm talking near future, uh, like this decade, um, is going to, we're going to completely eclipse uh, what we've accomplished in the past. I'm I'm very confident that a lot of the uh, companies that deal, we deal with, a lot of the suppliers that we partner with are going to continue over the next uh, couple of years actually to set new records, which is pretty mind blowing given some of the records we have already set that, you know, that we're already setting. The, the economic projections for this year show the uh, global economy growing uh, 5.6 to 6%. That's the fastest growth rate we've had pre-recession in the, in the last 80 years. I mean, it's, uh, and, uh, 2022 is already being forecasted to be another a strong up year on 2021. Um, so uh, this thing's got legs and uh, technology and electronic components are a, a really important uh, piece of that. And now I think uh, it'd be hard to argue that we're not a really important driver of it. So I, it's a, I'm, I'm crazy optimistic. Does it mean there's not going to be a lot of bad days and there's not going to be some ups and downs and all, all of that. But um, the, the, the long term uh, curve is strongly up and to the right. Great. Now, now Dave, um, can you speak to the future for DigiKey? And I understand there's some big things happening for you right now. Yeah, yeah, you know it's, you know it's exciting times. It's it's you know this this COVID. What's what's interesting is this has affected people in such different ways. You know, so many industries devastated the entertainment, the the travel, et cetera, and then others. You know, we're talking about a boom in constraints, not able to meet the supply. And one of the silver linings is increased customer reach. More people find you when they're looking for products. You know, our customer count will grow at a. a far away, even higher rates than our revenue is growing, which bodes well for the future. And we get excited and we're all in. You know, this is one of those two years from now, if you look back, you say, what would we do differently? We're doing it now because we believe everything that Steve has shared. You know, Michael in the past has led the industry association for a number of years and gets a vantage point across a multiple number of manufacturers and distributors. So I think what you're alluding to is we're uh, we're just on the cusp now of launching our new warehouse. It's at 2.2 million square feet. It's 4x our current footprint. And and again, because we believe, I believe these other speakers on here that the long-term prognosis of our industry is um, you know is boundless. Now, will there be 
cycles. Yeah, we'll be talking about the 2018 and the 2020 and I'm sorry, the, the 2021 and who knows, a 2025 uptick in a recession. But if you notice over time, you know, despite those sinusoidal waves, every time I put a mechanical key into my home and unlock the door, I know there's at least one more application for electronics. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, we're starting to wrap up on time. Um, so I want to ask a couple fun questions here. And Dave, I'll start with you. Uh, in er- early 2020, everyone was hoarding toilet paper. So I have to ask, did your household hoard toilet paper? And in retrospect, is there something else you should have been hoarding on the electrical electronics side? You know, I will say I was um, I, I was surprised that my wife got to know both the UPS and the FedEx drivers on first name <laughs> basis because the number of shipments that were coming to the house. And I'd say we have it all right now. We've got enough toilet paper and uh, and hand wash for the next twenty years. So I'm looking to recreate some space in our home. So I don't know if there's any more we could have we could have hoarded or or built. But that's where we stand right now. We're in a remote area, so uh, e-commerce. We took advantage of the Amazons of the world and anybody else that we could get product in the door. Fair enough, Michael. I think, how I think I- indoor plumbing is it's right. It's it's only been a couple years since indoor plumbing even got the thief river. <laughs> <laughs> and electricity is right on the way, Michael, right behind it. So yeah, we're bullish. Is your new warehouse going to be also in thief river? It is right. We we actually built a bridge across the street, and, and you know it's we're in a, a pretty remote area. And the question around labor force that Steve mentioned earlier for us, you know, our PDC is the heartbeat of the company. And and when we planned for it five years ago, we assumed it would be in a bigger geography. But we started asking ourselves that you know, unfortunately, some people do need heart transplants, but nobody does it voluntarily. So. You know, we're, um, we like the challenge of continuing to find the labor pool up here. And, and the work ethic in this upper Midwest is like none that I've ever been a part of. So it's a, it, the community, it's rallies behind us. It's, it's an incredible, it's a fun story up here. Winners are long, but uh, people bond together. <laughs> Michael, any uh, hoarding confessions? And is there anything that you wish you had hoarded or are starting to hoard now? Yeah. So I, like every, it, it was a matter, it was a timing thing, right? The uh, sooner you figured it out and you hit your grocery store, the better or you hit your Costco, the better. And my wife and I actually got a, a little bit of a, a jump on this. So we were, we were in pretty good shape, but like a lot of people, I think we probably uh, over inventory. So I, I need to work off a little inventory, but it's it's the unexpected stuff that's still you know still hard to get. You know, um, it's we're, we're talking about electronics, but there's a lot of other day to day stuff that have long uh, long lead times. Um, you know, we're we're like a lot of people waiting six months to get a piece of furniture. But my uh, my the thing I wish I had hoarded is uh, my favorite candy from a kid is a Clark bar, and um, so, and I had a couple boxes of Clark bars going into the pandemic that uh, I chewed through pretty quickly and then discovered that I couldn't get any more. So I, I had a uh, Clark bar drought that uh, went on f- uh, far too long and they're still, still hard to get. So it's, uh, but, you know, it's, it's a little things that, uh, little comfort things. Daniel, we should offer to help Michael because if he's hoarded too much wine, that his wine cellar would be a place <laughs> that we would like to take more access to and, and have. And, so I, and I, I actually keep the Clark bars in the wine cellar. So in the event of an emergency, I've got all the basic needs re- uh, covered. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the price of admission to the wine cellar as a case of Clark bars. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. Steve, how about you? Well, you know, my wife was holding, uh, you know, hoarding toilet papers and frozen food items in the refrigerator and freezer like crazy. And I said, why are you doing all that? And it's just, you know, there was paper and everywhere. And if it was me, I would have run uh, microchip factories at full speed and bought (laughs) all those semiconductors the factories will produce that as CEO, I didn't want to store it within microchip, but I would have bought it from them. I don't know what the disclosures would be with SEC and all that. That would be a challenge. But if you could get around that, I could have bought all that millions of dollars of product and hold that in our store and garage and all that other than the toilet paper. And today it would be worth gold. I would have made so much money that it just was incredible. 
And toilet paper, we didn't make any money. We used it all. <laughs> <laughs> so all the supply chain folks are were, were well stocked going into the pandemic. So next time I see you at Costco with a big shopping cart full of full of product, I'll know to uh, stock up myself. Um, <laughs> uh, final final question for each of you: Is there any pet? Uh, pet's probably the wrong word, but any any. Uh, line you carry or any chip you manufacture that has a special place in your heart and can you share why why that is the case and uh, anyone can chime in here i can see the the, the wheels turning i you know i honestly um i i don't have a favorite and of course that's in my position that's probably the the, the intelligent answer but truly um uh it, it, it all has, we're very deliberate about how we build our supplier relationships and construct our line card uh, for particular applications. And um, I, man, we, we've got, we, we're not a broadliner. We don't have everybody. Um, and so the ones we have, we're really engaged, the suppliers we have, we're really engaged with. And um, I wouldn't trade a single one of them, quite honestly. They all have a, they all snap together to, uh, create something that's that's pretty awesome fair dave, enough of course is gonna, dave of course is going to have to uh cuddle up with steve here uh, as, as a starting <laughs> point so let's just get that out of the way dave <laughs> no my answer was going to be easy it's parts are like kids you love them all but you like some of them at more than others at certain periods of time <laughs> fair enough that was very very uh that was a good safe answer and you know yeah. who you are, I think, is the, the way to follow that up, right? <laughs> so, you know, rather than picking a part, I think I'll pick a quote from uh, Andy Grove, who once said that, you know, bad companies uh, fail in a crisis and good companies survive through the crisis and come on the other end. But great companies get stronger through the crisis and come on the other end you know, even even stronger than ever before. And I think you are suddenly seeing three companies here on the panel that have come out of the crisis even stronger. I think our customer relations have gotten stronger. And it's not that we didn't deliver every part our customer wanted. We didn't. Of course, there were lots of delinquencies. But how we treated the customers and how we did that better than our competitors were able to do and how we were you know, shown empathy for it and help them find parts sometime in distribution, in brokers, or help them redesign the part with a substitute product. I think uh, we came out of the pandemic not only as a company with a record sales, and this quarter we're up 25% over a year ago, uh, but that is coming at uh, record gross margins, record profits, and record appreciation by the customers, even though you know, we're letting them down with delivery challenges, but we're still the best compared to the others. Fair enough. And as we as we wrap up, you have all worked together, bumped into each other at trade shows, interacted for for decades, from what I understand. This is now your chance on the record to share a maybe embarrassing story about each other. Does anyone have I hear Michael might have some pictures <laughs> stashed away. Any anything you want to uh, get on the record here? I, I like my job in this industry too much <laughs> to uh, share with you all the dirt I have on Dave and Steve. <laughs> so I'm going to take the fifth. <laughs> all right. Fair enough. You, fair enough. Get, Daniel, no takers there. That is that dangerous <laughs> turf because I had to, try. to be around for a little longer as well. <laughs> all right. So next time we see you at a trade show, we'll uh, yeah, <laughs> open up the, the bar tab and, and have a conversation. Yeah, the, well, thank I you all so tab. much for your time. It, is, <laughs> it has been a, a real pleasure to, to speak with all of you. Thank you for your, for your wisdom and insight. Likewise. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you to Winbond for sponsoring this keynote. Now, I know we had a lot of podcasts this week, so if you missed any, don't forget you can catch the video versions of them on the Industry Tech Days 2021 webpage at allaboutcircuits.com, as well as the dozens of other live sessions from that event. Thanks for listening and joining me in the lobby today. I'm Daniel Bogdanoff, and I'll see you next time.